Hello, I'm R. Shankar from the Yale Physics Department, and I'm here to discuss this book uh, written by my colleague, Doug Stone. So Doug, uh, what makes this interesting for me is that first of all, you've written a book, and the book is about quantum mechanics. And that's really how we met many, many years back when I was a struggling postdoc at Harvard, and I was teaching in the summer school, and I was teaching quantum mechanics, preparatory to writing a book. And you are one of the four students who never gave me a minute's peace during those lectures, but you obviously have mastered the subject well enough to write this book. So first question is, what took you so long? <laughs> Well, the, what took me so long is that you did the easy thing, right? So you taught me quantum for the first time. It's this mind-blowing subject where you have to throw out everything you know about physics and billiard balls, and suddenly things are tunneling through walls and so on. I won't repeat the dirty joke you made at the time. And uh, 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 so as soon as you learn this subject, you say, okay, I want to go teach somebody, which is exactly what you did, right? So you wrote the... Uh, classic textbook, which is a bestseller uh, now in, uh, in physics uh, on this, and, and you kind of taught the subject to physicists. And I didn't see where the market was for me to just try to do what you had done, particularly since I helped you so, you know, so much with writing it. Uh, no, actually, that's true. Uh, in my dedication, I mentioned my debt to you for making me think so hard about the book. Yeah. And you were always relentless in pursuing everything. Right. So uh, that, that was a great example, but you know me coming from my social science background and philosophy background, I wanted to write something not for physicists, but for the general audience. It might be also interesting to physicists, but certainly something you could read with very few equations. And uh, so I didn't know how to do that. What would be interesting? And then through some serendipity, I discovered that there was this big misunderstanding among both the general public and physicists about Einstein's role. Einstein, the most famous scientist in history. Well, that looks like a bad topic because when I tried to write my quantum book, they said we already have one, thank you. In fact, <laughs> we already have 20. <laughs> there are probably 500 books on Einstein. So you got to justify your chopping down all the trees to write your book. <laughs> so what's your reason? Well, so, so, uh, it turns out that there are a thousand books written on relativity, and there are another 200 biographies which slice and dice him at all angles. But since quantum is such a challenging subject, and since Einstein at the end of his life said that he didn't like the theory, he wasn't going to use it, uh, people have never written a book which uh, just ignores essentially relativity and instead focuses on his contributions to this other theory, the theory of atoms and of, of stuff in the world. And it turns out when you strip away all the sort of distraction of his brilliant work in relativity, but very distracting, uh, then you see, wow, he's actually the father of quantum too. Yeah, I think uh, I was surprised. As you said, uh, I've thought about teaching quantum mechanics a lot and you don't see Einstein's name that much even in the textbooks. There's something about the photoelectric effect, and that's about the end. It's all about Max Planck and everybody else. But when I read your book, I realize that even though Max Planck is the father of the quantum mechanics, he kind of disowned his own baby fairly soon. And Einstein is the one who fearlessly took up uh, the notion of the quantum of quantized energy and quantized action and ran with it uh, when most of his senior colleagues were skeptical. That's the part that's certainly not well known. Yeah. Well, since it took 26 years to do go from Planck's first idea in 1900, uh, which is how I start the book, all the way to Schrodinger and Heisenberg in 1925-26, many of the people that were there when the final solution arose didn't know what happened in the first decade or so when Einstein was the only lone, you know, crier in the wilderness saying things are really going to have to change. There's going to have to be a totally new theory. And that's really what, what captivated me, that the story of Planck, as I begin the book, is more a story of damage control, because his reputation is in danger, than it is one of trying to, to find a new 
set of laws of physics. And it was really Einstein five years later and then for the subsequent five years who mostly worked on that and said there is going to have to be a new law of nature for atoms. I think there are two nature. interesting things I learned from the book. Number one, uh, the people we associate with quantum mechanics really were not behind Einstein in the support of quantum mechanics, even though some of them were the inventors of it. And the question is, uh, what gave him the conviction that this was the right path? And also, maybe it'll be helpful if you spell out what all he did for quantum mechanics. In other words, what are the three or four things that are at the heart of quantum mechanics? And you got to tell me where Einstein's fingerprints are in the birth of those ideas. Yes. Well, of course, you know, this is, is really what the book is about, so I'll have to just kind of throw out a few tidbits, hopefully, that will, will stimulate people to actually look at the book. But the first one is this idea that energy can't change uh, continuously. You know, if I, uh, if I have a pendulum and it's swinging back and forth and it has some energy in it, I can just move the pendulum a little higher and it'll go fast, you know, back and forth faster, uh, sorry, with more energy. And uh, I can do that continuously. But with an atom, if I try to change the energy of an electron, you can't do that continuously. And this is often attributed to Planck, but it's actually really something that flows from Einstein's work. And Planck essentially tried to run away from this implication of his own work. So just there at the beginning of quantum, when the word quanta or quantization came in, Einstein really was the one that gets a lot of credit. Um, then he was the one that realized that after uh, 50 years or 60 years of thinking of electromagnetic waves, light and the other kinds of electromagnetic waves as just being a wave phenomenon, he suddenly said, no, 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 actually maybe they could be particles too. And now we do think of light that way as being made up of both uh, as of particles called photons, although they have wave-like properties. I have to interrupt you for a second. It is true that wave particle duality is at the heart of quantum mechanics. I have never heard it associated with Einstein in any kind of textbook I felt like reading. Whereas in your book, there are actual words written by Einstein where he says explicitly that he imagines a time when you will have to describe uh, particles and waves at the same time when you want to talk about the electron. Yeah, so that quote uh, from 1909, which is 14 years before de Broglie, who's now usually the one you always mention in this regard, uh, was extraordinary, and I even have quotes from people in the audience saying, you know, Planck immediately got up and squashed it and just said, no, he didn't quite agree with it, and Planck was so much more eminent that it, it just didn't get anywhere. So uh, this, this pillar of quantum theory, which we associate with a much later era and other names, is actually really due to Einstein. And now one of the very little known things that I go on to talk about a little bit in my book is that when you have this problem that is it a wave or is it a particle, the way we resolve that today is by saying, well, the wave is a wave of probability. And this is always associated as an idea of Max Born, Einstein's close friend. But in fact, it turns out Einstein had been saying this for about four years or five years before Born came up with the idea. And he just took it from Einstein's application to light and applied it to electrons. And then he wrote to Einstein saying, see, look how well your idea is doing with electrons, with Schrodinger waves. So it's interesting that the part of quantum mechanics Einstein is supposed to have hated, namely the probabilistic notion, right. is the one that he brought up for the first time. And it's, it's kind of crazy because he just threw it out there. He, you know, it was almost like a throwaway. Yes, if you can't really figure out the final theory, then this is a stopgap measure, and of course you can do this. But he was the first one to do it. You know, I mean, and it's not clear that Born and these other people would have thought of that if they didn't know it from Einstein's informal reasoning, which was never published, but which we know about through other people's letters. Talking about letters, uh, you mentioned a very interesting letter he got from the Indian Comet, <laughs> which would be a very interesting story to read, even if you did not care anything about science, just to see how uh, ethical behavior should be like and how people trustingly write to experts asking for yeah. their support. And sometimes they get it, sometimes they get scooped. And so tell me a little more about yeah, the so Indian th Comet. Th thank you. So the Indian Comet, as you know, <laughs> is, uh, is the term I used for Sachendra Nath Bose, who was a brilliant young physicist but unknown to the world in India 
around the early 1920s, his career was beginning, and he was trying from a great distance to make sense of, of quantum theory as it was evolving, and he had an idea of how to move it forward uh, beyond some, some intermediate notions of classical physics. He sent this paper to Einstein, and if you read this in a Hollywood script, you'd say, oh, come on, this is ridiculous, you know. Einstein's the most famous scientist in the world, one of the most famous people in the world. He doesn't know this guy. He doesn't read English very well. This thing comes in English. The guy asks him to translate it for him. Who's, who's, who asked Einstein to translate their paper? You know, and so, uh, but somehow Einstein reads it, fights his way through the English, and re decides it's right, and then goes on and promotes this idea uh, and really extends it and understands it more deeply than Bose. And now, because Einstein always spoke about it as Bose's idea, half of the fundamental particles in physics are called bosons after Sachendranath Bose. Mm -hmm. And the Nobel Prize was given only after the year 2000 for actually confirming the phenomenon of Bose condensation, of Bose-Einstein condensation. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to say a little bit about what that is. That's another popular idea. Well, there is something that got into the the, the public eye because it was sort of a holy grail for physicists, which was to show that if you cooled things down low uh, to low enough temperature, which even though it really feels very, very cold today outside, we're not quite at the, you know, 10 to the minus 9 degrees above absolute zero that it actually took. But, uh, uh, but if you get there, you can make all the atoms behave exactly identically, fall into the same quantum state, and they then flow without any friction. And in condensed matter, as you know, this leads to superconductivity, which is actually an important phenomenon technologically in magnets for MRI and things like that. But Einstein was the source of all of that. Bose himself never understood this condensation phenomenon. Also, uh, coming to the end, in his later years, he, with Podolsky and Rosen, wrote this very important paper uh, where he told the world why he cannot accept quantum mechanics. But in doing so, he spelled out what is really true about quantum mechanics. Nobody has changed their mind on how bizarre quantum mechanics is. All he was saying is that he couldn't accept it. But he had put his finger on the craziest part of quantum yeah. theory. So yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great place to, to conclude. Let me just say two things about that. So first, the question is, uh, what is it uh, that led him to reject this theory, which is now so successful that it underlies all our modern technology of computers, lasers, communication, chemical processes. It's, it's, it's fundamental to, to the technology of the 20th and 21st century. And it was already beginning to be so when he was rejecting it. So the reason he rejects it, as I argue in my book, is that in quantum theory, as you taught me, there is this reference to the observer, and things change in the physical universe when an observation is made. But Einstein believed that he was discovering eternal truths about nature that didn't rely on having any humans in the universe at all. Mm -hmm. And he felt that this standard view of quantum theory undermined the whole philosophical reason that he did physics and that, that he felt like he did a world outside it. there yes. and our job is to describe it and not to be part right. of it. Exactly. And he yeah. kept saying that to the very end. He used to say it very yeah. briefly with the phrase, uh, do you really believe the moon isn't there when you don't look at it? But his last gift to quantum theory that you alluded to was to actually tease out the craziest thing in it which is that two distant particles can be somehow affecting one another in what's called entanglement. He called it spooky action at a distance. And, um, uh, and that, to him, meant that it couldn't really be describing reality because nothing can travel over distances instantaneously. And now we know that that implication of his is actually completely correct. He was hoping it was a disproof, right. but it wasn't. And it now underlies this modern uh, 21st century, not yet realized technology of quantum computing that we're so involved in at Yale that it's kind of ironic that uh, as I go back to my lab, I'll be looking at people working on this entanglement at a distance. So, Okay. Uh, well, that's very nice. So I want to conclude by asking you to confirm or deny a rumor that 
uh, this book of yours is going to be made into a movie, <laughs> and I'm being seriously considered <laughs> to play either the photon or the electron. Oh, I thought you were going to be the Indian Comet. Okay. But I think there's one thing I think our inexperience is showing. I don't think we've actually said the title of the book at any point in this discussion. Okay, why don't you read it out? Okay. <coughs> Einstein and the Quantum, The Quest of the Valiant Swabian. Uh, you will, uh, uh, you will find out. Coming to a theater out. near yeah, you. Yeah, coming to a theater near you. Uh, right after Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Okay. Thank you very much.